First, I want to express gratitude, and I want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for buying a ticket. For those of you who are going on to the reception afterwards, I'm sorry to let those of you who don't have a ticket that's totally sold out, but the, those of you who do have a ticket, the reception is not here. It's at a yoga studio about a mile from here, and the directions are on the table if you don't have those in your phone or something. So it's an easy drive, and it's a gorgeous yoga studio. And the whole reception is hosted by John Berg, and he's not here in the room now, but I wanted to thank him uh, for his generosity in hosting a party there. I also want to thank Sophia University, because we are located in Santa Cruz, is our main office, and we are looking for a way to become more involved in Silicon Valley and the larger San Francisco Bay Area. And I reached out to Jim Fadiman, who I just is going to say a few words here in a second. And um, he said, well, maybe it's possible you could have an office here. And I met with Liz Lee, who is Liz here, the president, the current president. She's somewhere, she's out there greeting people probably. She's the current president of Sophia, and she was just incredibly gracious and, and visionary about the future of the school. And she said, well, why don't you rent an office and you can use these meeting spaces um, as part of your rent. And so we're getting this incredibly below market rate rent in our office, and we're getting to use these incredible meeting spaces. This is the biggest one, and there's others throughout the building. So I really want to thank her and have Jim say a few words about transition. I'm one of the few people here who can say, these are my people, and these are my people. <laughs> As, um, Bob Frazier founded the school, and I helped him a lot, and I'm still here, and so it's he. And so we have been cutting edge um, since the beginning, and of course there's been undercurrent of all different states of all sorts. And so it's a real pleasure that we are now linking up with maps um, more directly, um, our students are more interested in psychedelic research. There was a poll last year among the, the graduate students what they want for their various electives, and uh, psychedelics was number one. <laughs> <laughs> Either they want to know more, or they just want some cover, I'm not sure. <laughs> but this is a connection, and this is part of the, um, that we're both, in a sense, cutting edge institutions, and we are also mainstream institutions. Uh, Sophia is a fully, is a fully accredited university in many of its programs, and that we are begin, indeed at the other cutting edge, which is technology, um, which, as some of you know, interacts with psychedelics in, in some other ways. So I just wanted to welcome you all to the family that you're part of that you didn't know yet. <laughs> and then we're just very grateful you're here. And um, I, I finished um, acid test last night <laughs> out of a certain polite desperation. <laughs> and I am uh, stunned at what a remarkable book it is and what remarkable stories it says and how deeply um, willing these people were to put their whole lives on the line uh, so that we could all move forward towards making people freer and able to get the help they need when they need it. So thank you very much. that I've 
been working on in my life that I, I think also there's a certain parallel in the culture. So at a young age, um, I was a Vietnam War draft resistor, um, an LSD user, and so I basically identified myself as a counterculture drug using criminal. <laughs> But I didn't want to be a criminal. I didn't really, you know, there, there wasn't the thrill of being um, this sort of a rebel. I really grew up in a mainstream home, just sort of by circumstances found myself in this other situation, ready to go to jail for not going to Vietnam. And so the arc of my life uh, has been becoming more mainstream in certain ways. Um, you know, I, I eventually, um, studied with Stan Groff and learned about psychedelic psychotherapy. Um, Jimmy Carter pardoned all the draft resistors, so I was no longer a criminal in that regard. And then I eventually uh, managed to get into the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and have a master's and PhD from there. And, um, last week, for example, I was in Washington, D.C., of uh, all things addressing Grover Norquist's <laughs> center-right coalition. Grover, who of course spoke at Burning Man, um, but I had known him before from 2005, where uh, one of the senior Republican lobbyists had a cluster headache problem, and LSD helped him with it. And so these sort of diseases cut across, you know, political lines and cultural lines. And so this sort of Republican lobbyist was able to introduce me to Grover at that time. And, and Grover and I disagree on an awful lot of things. Um, I would say most everything <laughs> except for this uh, principle of uh, a certain amount of uh, freedom that we should all have to explore our consciousness. And so on that grounds, I was able to um, address you know, these uh, 150 Republican uh, strategists. Uh, I didn't really get any support. And then in the afternoon, I spent more time with the um, Democratic Progressive Caucus. And, you know, <laughs> the more normal allies, but in our current situation, uh, the Obama administration is a little bit uncomfortable about making progressive changes without bipartisan support. And so even though we have this um, democratic support, we really don't have enough on the other side. So this idea for me of trying to move from this countercultural criminal position to something where psychedelics can also be seen not as symbols of cultural rebellion and symbols of constantly challenging the status quo in a way that's you know wanting us to move and create our own private utopias. That it's more about changing things from the inside out, and I think that's what we're trying to do um, with this psychedelic research. And so the the big picture though is that while we're going to be talking, and Michael and Annie are going to you know we say transforming medicine, and we're talking about MDMA research, it's really not about, at the deepest level, it's not about medicine for me. Um, it's more about um, global spirituality. And this was uh, something that came to me when I was 18, and this idea that with the murderous uh, examples that we see in the 20th century through uh, Hitler and through totalitarianism and through Vietnam and elsewhere, and that we see in our world reflected today, that what, what's really dividing a lot of people um, is this um, allegiance to their particular religious um, belief system that, that causes this us and them situation. And I think that's really fundamentally a big part of the problem. And that this idea of the spiritual experience, the unit of mystical experience, the non-dual thinking, that helps us to realize that we're not really separate, that we're all together, and that it's not just us humans, it's nature, it's life itself, and death included, that we're all part of this together. And if we can identify as uh, more what we share with others is greater than what's different, then we'll have more tolerance and compassion and empathy. And for me, that didn't come through my bar mitzvah, <laughs> which uh, I had hoped, or through my traditional training, although I learned a lot from my you know, religious upbringing. And I think for most people, um, the current rites of passage in our culture don't really produce those kind of deeply felt experiential senses that we are 
you know, surrounded by love, this incredible, you know, multi-billion dollar, billion year <laughs> dollar history of the world, that where, you know, there's something magical, mystical going on, but we don't often think about it because we're so focused on survival. And if we can have that experience, and for me and for many others, it comes through psychedelics. And this was confirmed for me by, of all places, Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations for about 30 years, and was the mystic of the UN. And in the early 80s, he wrote this book, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And his thesis was that the United Nations is trying to help mediate conflicts between cultures, between countries, but the religious conflicts are deeper, and we need the mystics of the world to sort of come together and to realize that they have more in common with the mystics of the other religions than with the fundamentalists of their own religion. And if we could anchor this in millions and billions of people having this deeply felt experience, not just the knowledge. Uh, you know, Rita Marley uh, has this album, Who Feels It, Knows It. I think that, that's the sense that psychedelics can do that. And it's not the only way to do it. I don't want to say that you know, you need psychedelics, people can do it in other ways. But for me, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it in any other way. And so I think the work for me is to try to make a culture that doesn't suppress access to non-ordinary states of consciousness. And that, in fact, welcomes it and welcomes the tools that produce it. And when we look around the world, the Western culture is more of an anomaly than a pattern the way it normally is. Most cultures have welcomed not ordinary states of college and consciousness. And in fact, so has the Western culture. The, the longest mystery ceremony that we know about in the history of the world was the Eleusinian Mysteries that were for 2,000 years. They were the Greeks that were ended by the Roman Catholic Church in 396. So even the roots of our own culture had this once a year mystical experience. So for me, how do we then, as a strategic matter, as a tactical matter, bring about a culture where we can welcome this? And for me, looking around at our culture where every corner has a drugstore and where every other TV ad is for some drug that you should take to make you feel better, you know, that it's through medicine and through science, that those are the ways to change the cultural attitudes about drugs and to help us overcome this horrible burden of prohibition that is so self-destructive. So the work for us with medicine is you know, it, it stands or falls on the basis of the science. It is about the medicine. It is about finding ways in which psychedelics can be helpful for different clinical conditions. And that's really the, the main focus of our work. But I think we need to acknowledge that we're not trying to create a medical priesthood where the only ways you can get this are through the doctors. And most people don't have a diagnosable illness. We all have trauma just from living in this world but we don't all have post-traumatic stress disorder. And so most people will need a bigger regulatory context to have these experiences outside of medicine and for personal growth, uh, for spirituality. And that's gonna require changing drug policy more towards even what Grover Norquist talks about in terms of freedom, liberty, and freedom of thought. So I see the work as um, the, that we're going to talk about, the work that we're asking for your help with, the work to develop psychedelics into prescription medicines for a range of different things, as the strategy to eventually be able to ground our culture in these uh, experiences that are available to people for this sense of global spirituality. And when I wrote a letter to Robert Mueller in the 1980s, I said, I read your book, but you didn't say a word about psychedelics. And every new way of killing gets unlimited money. And so, you know, here's a, something that could help your strategy. Would you uh, help me open the door to psychedelic research? He actually wrote me back, which, and he said he would help. So that was his confirmation. All right, so now, in terms of um, where we're at, um, I'd like to contrast 1984 and 2014, so 30 years. Our first study that we ever did with MDMA was in 1984. And we, I mean the underground psychedelic therapy community and those psychologists and psychotherapists and psychiatrists interested in this. And that was at a time when um, 
there had been this um, thriving community that had been just regenerated in the middle to late 70s of psychotherapists. therapists. Everything was criminalized in 1970 through the, uh, the research was shut down for decades. And then MDMA came around and it was still legal. And it was adopted by a small group of therapists who were uh, practicing as if it were illegal. So as word would not get out and it would then become criminalized. But uh, about half a million doses of MDMA were taken in this underground psychedelic psychotherapy setting and the DEA had no knowledge of it. Some of the people that got it in that setting thought more people should have it, here's a great way to make money, let's sell it out in the open and it became ecstasy. And it became sold in public settings, attracted the DEA's attention. And it was clear once I learned about MDMA in 1982 that there was going to be this crackdown. But we had this golden moment where it was still legal. And that's where Robert Mueller came in. And he introduced me to mystics of multiple different religions. And we were able to work with psychiatrists and politicians and others to sort of see people. So when the crackdown came, um, we'd be prepared. And we'd have people willing to speak out that had credibility. And so we did this sort of quiet safety study uh, in Stinson Beach <laughs> um, with about 30 people. It was a safety study. And the results were kept secret. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't kept secret for very long because in the summer of 84 is when the DEA filed in the um, Federal Register they wanted to criminalize MDMA. So that's where um, I went to Washington and filed for a, a hearing, a DEA Administrative Law Judge hearing, which we eventually won. Uh, DEA can ignore the or reject the recommendations, which they did, and then we won in the appeals court, won in the appeals court, and then eventually lost. And then the only way through, it seemed, was nonprofit drug development because MDMA was invented in 1912, patented in 1914, there's no patent rights, the therapeutic uses are all in the public domain, pharmaceutical companies weren't interested. So it seemed the government wasn't going to pay for it, big foundations weren't going to pay for it. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to start this nonprofit that would be focused on trying to bring MDMA back, and that's MAPS in 1986. Um, I didn't realize at the time that no drug had ever been paid into a medicine by a nonprofit organization. Uh, but that happened for the first time in 1999, and that was the abortion pill, RU46. And again, it's a controversial drug abandoned by the pharmaceutical industry, nobody would take it, and so it became um, a model, again, 13 years after I started MAPS, that it is possible. But I didn't really care if it was possible. I just felt this was something I needed to do. And hopefully I would feel better by doing it. I would feel terrible if I didn't do it. This is what I thought was most important. And now, 30 years later, after our first study, I'm really proud to say we have no regulatory obstacles in our way. There are absolutely none. Now, ironically, Medical marijuana is politically blocked from being made into an FDA-approved medicine. It's easier to do psychedelic research all over the world than it is to do medical marijuana research. And it's a quirk of history. Right now, the federal government has a monopoly through the National Institute on Drug Abuse on the supply of marijuana for, um, for research. And they make it very difficult or impossible to get. And then there's also extra reviews. But a group of people at the FDA in 1992, when we had approached them with a project to look at MDMA for cancer patients with anxiety, um, they had a special advisory committee meeting and they decided that they would put science before politics when it came time to psychedelics and marijuana research. So the FDA has been for the last 22 years solidly in favor of letting this research happen. Not because they're pro-psychedelic or pro-marijuana, but they're pro-science. And that's what's then enabled us to build up a small body of scientific literature and studies that is demonstrating safety, demonstrating preliminary evidence of efficacy, and it just snowballs and gets easier and easier and easier. So now there are absolutely no regulatory obstacles. And I spend most of my time on a political level fighting to overcome the obstacles for marijuana. That's what I was doing with Grover Norquist. So, um, Unfortunately, I've not been very successful in that. So there's a lot more work to do that. But I see it's like the front lines of politics being blocked, blocking science is medical marijuana research. And I see that as the work there 
is defending the, the political games we've made with psychedelics. So that's where I'm, I'm mostly doing my political work is on medical marijuana. Now, the, the other thing, there's a, a few, there are really no key scientific problems anymore, either, in our way. The, the biggest problem, and Jim could share this too, was the whole question of double blind. How do you do double blind placebo controlled studies with psychedelics? Where if somebody gives you a placebo, <laughs> you know, you can tell it's not LSD or MDMA. How, and that's the way that FDA is structured in order to approve drugs as medicines. You need to say, compare, you have to double blind placebo controlled studies. So that's been the biggest scientific challenge. And that's what I focused a lot of my dissertation on. And that challenge has recently been solved by uh, a method, again, about thinking about mainstreaming. So I started out maps, and our, our effort was to be the opposite of big pharma. You know, we're not trying to monopolize anything. We're not, all of our protocols are out in the open. There's no intellectual property. There's no proprietary rights. We're doing the opposite of big pharma in all these different ways. But big pharma does something really smart that um, I, I didn't realize. And now we're doing it too. And what is that? It's to hire retired FDA officials <laughs> as consultants. And we've done that. And so, in fact, we have the uh, former director of the FDA Division of Psychiatry Products, who has reviewed our research for the 20, last uh, about almost 20 years, who's recently retired. And we've had a series of meetings with him. And, and basically what he's reassured us with is that the double-blind problem is insoluble. I mean, we have been trying multiple different ways. Mike and I can talk about all, all the ways where we've tested um, low doses of MDMA, 25 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 75 milligrams. We're trying to figure out where do you get a certain amount of confusion between what dose people are getting, where they can't tell the difference between the low dose and the high dose exactly, but they know they've got something. And the problem is that the low dose, for it to be differentiated you know, from the high dose, if, if it doesn't have much activity, you can tell it apart, but then that doesn't serve the purpose. So when you start getting a little bit higher with this low dose, then you start getting efficacy too. And then it gets really complicated because you're no longer comparing against the placebo. So what we learned from the FDA is that they acknowledge, it's a dirty secret of clinical studies, that there's often telltale signs that drugs through their side effect profiles, other ways, that the double blind really doesn't hold up a lot of times. And so what they said, what Tom said was that just compare against inactive placebo, and then what's very important is the other elements of scientific integrity of your study. In particular, the independent rating. So that we don't have the therapist, like Mike Lenetti, rating how well the patients are doing. Because that could be something that they could be accused of being biased. So we have a group of independent raters that administer the CAPS. PTSD was well chosen because it's um, an outside rater, the clinician administered PTSD scale. And it's something that can be done more and more we're using. We're going to be moving towards telemedicine, where you have a group of raters trained uh, with inter-rater reliability, and then they will randomly be assigned to the patients, and they won't know, is this their first dose, is this their baseline, is this their outcome, their final outcome data. That's the key to scientific integrity when you don't have double blind. So we no longer really have scientific problems anymore either. Uh, we, we figured out that for PTSD, that MDMA works regardless of the cause of PTSD. Our first study was mostly women survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Now we're doing studies with um, veterans, uh, firefighters, and police officers, mostly male, or they were mostly female. Um, Zoloft and Paxil, the drugs that are approved by the pharmaceutical industry for PTSD, mostly worked in women, didn't hardly work at all in men. So we figured out that at least this approach, it doesn't matter the cause of the we also have developed our therapeutic style and we've created a treatment manual. And we have trained uh, raters that evaluate the videotapes of the therapists to make sure that they're adhering to this method. Not that we say that our method is the absolute best method, but we think, we think it is. And we're gonna be trying to 
you know, verify that with outcome data, but we have a method, and it's been reviewed by National Institute of Mental Health experts in treatment manuals, and they say it looks like a manual. <laughs> so, so we've got that. The only big question that we're still struggling with, um, with our phase two studies, which are going to be done by next summer, is the exact dose. One of the things that um, we've been surprised about in the current study that Michael and Annie are doing is that the people at the medium dose are actually, on average, doing a little bit better than the people with the full dose, meaning that the 75 milligram dose group is doing great. The 125 is still doing really great enough to get it approved, but there's some question about, like when I do MDMA, I want 125 milligrams. <laughs> Most people, you know, most underground therapists use that, but there may be some. Um, work related to memory reconsolidation, which is the operative theory that we're exploring now, that maybe at lower doses you don't have these waves of body feelings, you don't have all these other experiences, but you can take the traumatic memory and reintegrate it, reconsolidate it without the fear, perhaps better at lower dose. So we're still trying to figure that out and now doing 100 milligrams. So that's the main scientific issue. Our primary limitations right now are um, twofold, financial, and also figuring out how to train therapists. We have a small group of therapists that we're working with now, and we're going to need to expand dramatically when we move to phase three. Uh, we're doing a, a therapy training program in England coming up in December, uh, but we don't want to take uh, our therapists who are mostly focused on finishing our studies and having them train other therapists that we're not quite ready for. So, so we have to figure out how do we train therapists, how replicable, replicable is this approach? Um, does it take excellent therapists only, or you know, can we really have tens of thousands of therapists doing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and getting good outcomes? So that's what we're still trying to figure out. But basically, we have this open door, and we have a very unusual um, opportunity and you know there always can be a backlash but I don't see it coming right now and so I think we're in a really good footing and we've also expanded beyond just work for MDMA PTSD we've started a study at UCLA with MDMA for autistic adults with social anxiety we're about to start a study with Phil and Julaine there and others on uh, people with life-threatening illnesses with anxiety related to that to help them with MDMA um, part of the training in December is even going to be couples therapy. So couples therapy is one of the best uses of uh, MDMA. Uh, but it's not a disease to have a difficult <laughs> relationship. So we can't actually make MDMA into a medicine or couples therapy. But at the same time we're trying to understand how to do that and we're now because of the um, incredible work of Richard Rockefeller who um, is was the son of David Rockefeller, the oldest living Rockefeller. He was the chairman of the board of advisors of Doctors Without Borders and saw incredible trauma all over the world and decided that this multi-generational trauma was something that was just pervasive. And at the same time, it's happening in all these places in the world where they don't have the resources for a lot of psychotherapy. And he started thinking, what could help? And he felt that it might be MDMA. So over the last four years, um, Richard was our, our main partner in a way. And he actually um, tragically died a couple months ago in a plane crash. But he helped us. For 25 years, we've been trying to do work with the military, with the VA, and with uh, the Department of Defense. And you know, I, I remember um, back in the 60s where Abby Hoffman and the others you know, surrounded the Pentagon. And there was this whole Vietnam War protest that tried to levitate the Pentagon. <laughs> So now we're trying to dose, <laughs> and, it's, and it's, I should say that it's working. And so we, we now have been able, because of the dire crisis of more than 22 veterans a day committing suicide, we've been able to get over the political resistance at the VA after 25 years of trying because of Richard's work, so that we work from the bottom up and then his uh, cousin is uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller, who's on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So we've had top down, bottom up, and, and we've had these major breakthroughs now where we are um, actually giving a grant. <laughs> We're giving a grant to the military <laughs> to um, do some of these proof of principle studies, and we're training their therapists. This is a lot of the main work that Michael and Annie are doing now to try to um, 
bring into that culture. And, and, and when you look back at the, the counterculture, you look back at the 60s, a lot of it became this split because of Vietnam. And there was this cultural split that I think has been really detrimental. I think we need, the crises are so great that we need all of us working together to be able to move us to the next level and you know, overcome the challenges. And I think there's a sense inside the system, inside the military, inside the, you know, those of us who might still identify ourselves as counterculture to come together. And that's what we've seen with the, the Veterans Administration and Department of Defense. So now we're able to do a few studies there. And I think that's really the doorway into the culture. So that's a really optimistic perspective. I think we also see a crumbling of the support for the drug war and prohibition that California has really helped initiate, but it's happening everywhere, all over the world. And that's also in our favor, as also this one other factor, which um, is the aging of the baby boomers. <laughs> so baby boomers, a lot of them tried psychedelics when they were young, a lot of them gave them up for their work or for their families or drug tests at work, things like that. Now, when you get to be 60, 70, you start thinking about dying, you start thinking more spiritual thoughts, and also a lot of these people have credibility. They've done a lot of things in their lives. They have made accomplishments. They don't look like young, you know, hippie rebels. They look like, you know, parents who've done stuff in their lives. So, and they have resources, a lot of them too. So, the aging of the baby boomers, the crumbling of the drug war, you know, we now have our timeline to suggest that we can make MDMA into a medicine in uh, seven years, in 2021. So that, that's our current timeline. The other last thing is something new happened. It's, it's uh, uh, Congress passed a law in 1984, the same year that we did the uh, first study that I didn't even know about until a couple of years. And what it was, was this law that said that if you are trying to develop a drug into a medicine that's already been patented, there's no patent rights, use patents are all in the public domain, they wanted to encourage still the medical use, the medical development of those drugs. And so they created a program called data exclusivity. And what that means is that it's not like a patent, but if you produce the data, to make the FDA say, yes, I'm going to turn this into a prescription medicine. Nobody can use your data for five years. Somebody else could create their own data, or they could make MDMA into medicine for something else. It's not like a patent, but this program of data exclusivity means that for the first time now, we have the chance to build a sustainable nonprofit. So most causes, the needs are so great, they're constantly sort of addressing the needs. But for MAPS, we're in the unique position of trying to have a drug that can be marketed. We're trying to have a product. And now that I've surprisingly learned that, you know, there is this data exclusivity program. Actually, in Europe, it's 10 years. In the US, it's only five years. So now we have a chance to both um, make MDMA into a medicine and then earn money on the sale of medicine to fund research into other drugs as well and other uses of MDMA. Instead of constantly asking people for money, we have a chance of being, now we're not there yet. <laughs> so, don't relax. <laughs> but, um, but that's the long-term plan. And so we've been working with lawyers and accountants. And um, once somebody makes a medicine, you can't keep it inside the nonprofit because it's now a business. It's no longer part of the nonprofit purpose. So what we're experimenting with is what's called a benefit corporation. So if we look at one of the big resistances to the um, legalization of marijuana is everybody says that you don't want big tobacco and big alcohol selling it. You know, American, unbridled American capitalism selling drugs that have an abuse potential is, can be problematic. And we see that with alcohol and tobacco. So what we're trying to do is create a model where profit maximization is not the primary objective, but social benefit is. And so we're going to be putting that into place probably in the next few months. So that, that's the big picture. And I think that with, with your help and with the uh, tremendous work that Michael and Annie are doing that they're going to tell you about and our other therapists and the need in our culture, that we really do have a chance of uh, reintegrating psychedelics into our culture. And then I, I, I hope that the day has not come, but I hope I, I don't need to keep thinking of myself as a counterculture drug using criminal. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much.
audience to keep talking to people you disagree with. Uh, you've been a good example to me for that, in that way, for the almost 15 years we've been working together. I really appreciate all of you being here. It's, it's always great to be back in this area. And, um, you know, this is definitely a community, or as Jim says, a family effort. So, you know, we're doing what we're doing, and so many other people are doing other parts of it, and so many of you are supporting it in so many ways, and that's what makes it possible, because, you know, if it were up to the government or, or the drug companies, this would never be happening. Yet, here we are, actually making progress, a lot of progress. Um, so, <clears throat> I want to tell you about the, the research we've been doing. Um, it's all sponsored by MAPS, and my wife Annie and I do it together. I'm going to do most of the talking at first, but it's, it's definitely a, uh, a partnership. And um, Annie's going to do the good part at the end, read you some things that the people that, from the studies have said, which is the richest description of what we're doing, but I'm going to tell you some of the nuts and bolts in the meantime. There is an urgent need, I don't think I need to, to go on about this, but there's a really urgent need for better treatments for PTSD. There are um, 500,000 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans with PTSD and traumatic brain injury, and um, they're, you know, the, the the success rate for existing treatments for the drugs, it's um, not much use at all, except for it can decrease symptoms, the drugs can decrease symptoms, but we don't have any pharmaceuticals that really treat PTSD in a deep way. And, you know, the failure rate for existing the best treatments is probably at least 50%. So there, we're talking about two to four million people in the United States at any given time, and then all those veterans one committing suicide every 90 minutes. So we definitely need something better. Um, so why MDMA for PTSD? I'm not going to go on about this at length either, but MDMA seems to have some qualities that are particularly well suited for treating PTSD, which is a problem of uh, too much fear activation and not enough uh, ability to process that fear. So if MDMA can give people uh, can decrease fear and defensiveness uh, and without interfering with memory or lucidity. In fact, it may increase memory. That It makes sense that that would be a really good adjunct to psychotherapy for PTSD. This is um, one way to look at this. This is a, uh, an idea from other research about the, the fact that um, therapeutic change happens in this window of tolerance that, um, let me see if this will point. Anyway, um, you know, on the vertical axis is the level of arousal. If people are too or over aroused, flooded by anxiety, they can't process the trauma, they can't do good therapy. And on the other end of the spectrum, if they're hyper aroused, emotionally numb, is, which is the other problem with PTSD, they can't process it. So uh, the chance for healing happens in this optimal arousal zone, and we think that MDMA, one way, there are many things going on, uh, but one way to understand at least part of what MDMA is doing is giving people some time in this optimal arousal zone where they're not overwhelmed by fear, yet they're not emotionally numb, that allows them to to get through the blocks to therapy. Um, and that's certainly only part of it. There's a memory consolidation part that Rick alluded to. And then there's also the value of having a really affirming experience, which is part of what happens. And uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who's a major PTSD researcher, just wrote a new book that came out just a few weeks ago. And this is a quote from his book. Uh, that talks about that, that aspect of it. Being traumatized is not just an issue of being stuck in the past. It is just as much a problem of not being fully alive in the present. In order to return to proper functioning, the body needs to, the body needs to be restored to a baseline state of safety and relaxation. 
So that's part of what happens too. It's definitely not, in, in our sessions with people with PTSD, a lot of it is painful, difficult work. The MDMA makes it possible, not easy. Yet, there's also usually uh, some time in which people have these deeply relaxing and healing experiences, which seems to have a really direct effect on the PTSD as well. So this is um, uh, our, the front page of the paper, our paper from our first study, which we uh, started working on in 2000, started working on the protocol, finally got our, all our approvals in uh, February of 2004 started right after that and then we finally published the results in 2010 and see um, safety and efficacy of MDMA assisted psychotherapy in people with chronic post-traumatic stress disorder um, randomized controlled trial. Um, we screened 134 people on the phone, 27 in person. We ended up with 21 people enrolled and um, or they completed the study, and uh, eight, 13 of those got MDMA in the initial phase, eight got placebo, and then the seven of the eight placebo people crossed over to have MDMA sessions afterwards. So our hypothesis is that, was that MDMA could be safely admit, administered to um, people with treatment-resistant PTSD, and that it would produce improvement in PTSD symptoms as measured by standard outcome measures. Um, we measured them four or five days after it, uh, each of two or three experimental sessions and then at two months. And we used the same measures that they used for Zoloft and Paxil in the FDA, the trials that led to FDA approval. Um, the protocol is double blind, placebo controlled. Um, Everybody had to be treatment resistant. They had to have had psychotherapy and medications. Most people had a lot of both. The average duration of PTSD was 19 and a half years in this group of people. And um, it was, as Rick said, it was mostly um, crime-related PTSD, childhood sexual abuse, or rape. We only had, we had two veterans in that study. Uh, and we did careful medical and psychological screening beforehand. And the first stage was the double blind part when 60% of people got MDMA on two or three occasions and 40% uh, got placebo on two or three occasions with the same therapy. So it wasn't just a drug study, it was a study of drug-assisted psychotherapy. So the, the placebo group is really the therapy-only group. They had all the same all-day sessions with us, all the same preparatory follow-up sessions. And then stage two was the open label crossover in which people that got placebo in the first and stage one could get MDMA assisted therapy on two or three occasions. Um, the MDMA, these were not take home doses. The MDMA was given uh, only in, under direct supervision or direct support with male and female therapists, in this case, Annie and I were the therapists. Mm -hmm. Um, we measured the blood pressure and pulse. Yeah. Should I be pointing this back at you? Or? Oh, okay. We measured blood pressure and pulse uh, a lot more often than we thought was necessary, but exactly as often as the FDA thought was necessary. Um, the initial dose was 125 milligrams and then Partway through the study, we got permission to add a, a supplemental dose of half of that at two hours. And people, you know, Annie and I spent the day with them for eight hours plus, then they'd spend the night in the clinic with a night attendant, uh, and then we'd meet with them the next day, the next morning before they went home. We'd talk to them every day on the phone for a week. We'd meet with them three more times during that ensuing month. Um, for integration sessions. So there was a lot of attention to preparation beforehand, uh, preparing for people, getting to know them, preparing them for the approach to therapy, 
and then a lot of attention to helping them with integration afterwards because um, things got stirred up and sometimes people had uh, more symptoms following the sessions before they had fewer symptoms or they would have, we talk about waves of, of emotion and waves of symptoms coming up afterwards, it's not uncommon. So we think it's a very important part of the approach is to give people that support afterwards. This is where we do the sessions. Um, we have the futon made up more like a bed with cushions that lean against the wall if people want to sit up. Um, I sit over on the left side here. Annie sits on the other side. You can see she has blood pressure monitor, the sound system. There's a eye shades and headphones on the futon, so we encourage people, if they're comfortable with that, with the eye shades and headphones, to use those to help them focus inward part of the time. Approach, which as Rick said, we've, we've described in a manual now, is, uh, you know, we didn't come up, up with this um, ourselves. It's based on a lot of the things we've learned from people that went before. Stan Groff and Christine Groff have been major teachers of ours, and um, what we've learned from them and others, Ralph Messner, George Greer, Rick Talbert, um, Leo Zeff. Uh, we've kind of um, use what we've learned from all those people along with our own experience and training and working with trauma to um, come up with this method. Uh, it's a non-directive approach. It's aimed at supporting the person's own emerging experience. Uh, we're there to facilitate rather than direct. We talk to people a lot about the inner healing intelligence is what guides the process, not something that we um, know that they don't. Uh, we encourage people to spend quite a lot of the time focusing in without talking, with, often with eye shades and headphones, and then alternating periods of talking to us. And we think in most cases both are important, but there's a lot of variation. Some people talk a lot more than others. Um, and so we don't, have a, we don't have a agenda for that either. It's according to the person's own process. And you know, we're using the manual now to be able to have independent raters watch the videos. We video everything and we can see if, if we're doing what we say we're doing and if the people in the other studies which are now going on in Israel, Boulder, and Vancouver um, see if people are using the same method as we're attempting to. Um, this refers to, this is something that I, I think three people in the first study said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. It's, it's there to make the point that this is not just that people get blissed out and then everything's okay. Um, as I said, often really positive affirming experiences are, are part of it, but a lot of it is painful trauma work. But the MDMA, you know, people tell us they, it was like they couldn't get through the cement before, and now with the MDMA they're able to do it, even though it's not easy. The outcome measures we used are listed here. The main one is the clinician administered PTSD scale, which is considered the gold standard for, uh, and for PTSD research. Um, and so here are the results. Um, this is the um, caps, the main cap score on the vertical axis. Uh, that line in the middle is 50, and that is the cutoff for admission to the study. People had to have a cap score of at least 50, which uh, means at least moderately severe PTSD. So here's what happened with the placebo group. You can see that they started with a cap score of about 80, and after, um, on, on, the on the bottom line, I didn't say that the first time point is the baseline, the next one is four days after the first session, the next one is four days after the second session, and the last one is two months after the second session. So you can see people who got PTSD, who got placebo, who got therapy only, actually did have a, a significant improvement in their symptoms. It was actually, even in a small number, it was statistically significant. 
but you can also see they still had severe PTSD. So here's what happens when we do the same therapy with MDMA. Um, you can see dramatic improvement four days after one session, and then some continued further improvement. And it ended up, even with that good improvement with the placebo, we had a 33-point spread between placebo and MDMA on the caps. And just to give you a sense of what that might mean, in the Zoloft trials, the, the first drug that got an indication for PTSD from the FDA, they had a little less than seven point improvement over placebo. So we're not talking about a trivial improvement here. Um, and then in stage two, the people that got the uh, therapy only then had two open label, uh, two or three, the, the protocol changed a little, I won't go into the details, but they had two or three um, MDMA assisted sessions. And that's what happened. So the first time point uh, on the left is the, their baseline score of 80. Both groups had almost identical baseline scores. The second time point is uh, after all the therapy, but without MDMA. Then the third time point is after one. Um, the, the, actually, the third point of time point is after their second MDMA session. And then the fourth time point is two months later. So it shows that the people that with the placebo group is not a more treatment resistant group. You know, they didn't improve nearly as much in stage one as so you could say, well, maybe they were different somehow. But in fact, give them MDMA with the same therapy, they have the same results. Um, and because of um, a lot of noise about possible um, neuropsychiatric and neurotoxicity, we did extensive neuropsychological testing before and after MDMA placebo. These are the uh, measures we used. The, the main one was the R bands, repeatable battery for assessment of neuropsychiatric status. The results for all, all of them are similar, but here are the results for the R bands. On the left, before and after MDMA, on the right, before and after placebo. So, no indication of any neurotoxicity. In fact, there was a trend towards slight improvement, but it's essentially no change. That was reassuring, not unexpected. Uh, so then, those were great results at two months. Um, later, we decided it would be good to see what happened to these people later on. So we did a second um, arm extension of the study, and we tested people a year or more later with the CAPS, uh, a couple other measures, and uh, a questionnaire. And um, it ended up being, because we waited until we finished the original study, and the original study happened over almost five years because of recruitment. So it ended up being three and a half years later on average, at least a year, but average three and a half years later and here's what we saw. The bar on the left was the baseline caps before the study. The middle bar was two months after the last MDMA session, and the bar on the right was two months, was three and a half years later. Um, we didn't have everybody in that. We only had 16 of 19, so um, got to take that into consideration, but actually, um, based on the questionnaire, which we did get on everybody. We don't think the 16 were really different from the 19. But in any case, um, for most people, the benefit was maintained. There were two people in the long-term follow-up who had relapsed to cap scores over 50. Their, their data is included in that, that bar there. But, so it was very encouraging to see that this just wasn't just a flash in the pan. It also seems to make it much less likely that that was a placebo effect. It usually doesn't last three and a half years. Certainly with Zoloft it doesn't. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, we're, uh, we've got a training program for research therapists that we're doing um, as needed so far with watching a lot of video and talking about it. Um, we have a approved open protocol that allows us to give MDMA to people 
therapists who have been through our, our training program to have their own MDMA session with us in the same set and setting as the therapy. We've now done that with eight researchers so far. And so both of those we will gear up a lot more as we get closer to phase three and as we have lots of um, therapy teams in the Bay Area and other places. studies for, that are either completed or ongoing or about to start. Um, a couple years after our first study started, um, we collaborated with people in Switzerland who did a similar, slightly smaller study. They also had promising results with about the same effect size, although not as much change on the caps. We currently have studies going on in Israel, Colorado, and Vancouver. Um, there's a study with imaging that's going to start in England soon. That's why we're going to England in December to do a training. Um, and then the, main, the other main thing we're doing in our spare time is, uh, <laughs> and I are doing the study Rick talked about um, in Charleston uh, with veterans, firefighters, and police officers, mostly veterans. And we're almost finished with that. And it's, it's very similar to the first study, same therapeutic method. But we, we're using three different doses for the reasons Rick mentioned. Um, that's the title of the study, 24 veterans, firefighters, and police officers with um, treatment-resistant PTSD. And in stage one, um, people with similar um, criteria to get in, people have to have with caps of at least 50. Um, and then they're randomized to low, medium, or full dose, 30, 75, or 125 milligrams of MDMA, each dose followed by half of the original dose as an optional supplemental dose an hour and a half to two hours later. And with all the same accompanying preparatory sessions and integration sessions as we had in the first study. Um, and we do, we're not doing the outcome measures four days afterwards this time, we're doing them at uh, one month after the second session. So people have two sessions, whatever dose they get randomized to, 30, 75, 125, they get two sessions with that dose, double blind, a month apart. Uh, then a month after the second one of those, they have testing again to see where their symptom levels are. We break the blind, and then if they If they got full dose the first two times, then they have one more open label full dose session. If they got lower medium dose the first two times, then they have three open label full dose sessions a month apart. So everybody gets three full dose sessions eventually. Uh, and then we have another follow up in two months and one year with repeat measures. Uh, we've enrolled 19 veterans so far, two firefighters and one police officer. And this is the very sad fact. More than 650 people, without our doing any advertising or recruiting, more than 650 people from around the country have contacted us, wanting to be in the study, and it's probably quite a bit more since I left town the day before yesterday. We literally, the last, especially the last few weeks, but really chronically, we've been getting um, sometimes a couple emails and a couple phone calls a day and when we are going to enroll 26 people. So the need is very great. This is a list. Um, this is a, one of the firefighters. This is a list of the medications that he had been administered prior to getting in the study. Not all at once. But, uh, and people have to taper off all of their psychiatric medicines to be in the study. So he had been tried on uh, well, 10 SSRIs or other antidepressants, four benzos, and uh, five or six other things. 
And it, this is not at all unusual. Here's another list. This is a police officer woman. Those are the things she'd taken. Uh, Mountains of nine SSRIs, five benzodiazepines, and I think there's 11 other medicines. So 11 antipsychotics. Oh, right. That's right, 11 antipsychotics. And there were a number of antipsychotics in the first list, too. So, you know, psychiatrists are desperate to try to treat the symptoms, and they don't have a good treatment most of the time, so they end up throwing a lot of things at it. Very problematic. And of course, the side effects of many of these medicines are very severe. Um, so here's what happened. This, this is preliminary data. We haven't finished yet, but I wanted to give you a flavor that's looking pretty good again. So um, CAP score on the vertical axis. And this is baseline, and then one month after the second session. So you can see a 30 milligram dose uh, just had a little bit of improvement. 75 and 125, again, had a so it looks like it's working again. Um, well, and the other thing, um, I'll just let you appreciate that for a minute. Uh, <laughs> I do. Uh, we noticed in the first study that people were not surprising again, but people were telling us about all these improvements in, in their lives that weren't captured on the caps. And they're not going to be captured on any standardized measure but some of them might be able to be. So now we're doing some more measures of, of other kinds. And I'll show you the preliminary data on a few of those. This is the bank depression inventory. Um, and this was just really nice to see. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, lower is better. And uh, interestingly, the full dose had a lot more, group had a lot more depressive symptoms. But the fact is, um, nobody got more depressed. You know, there, you hear these things about, well, maybe MDMA uses up all the serotonin, people get depressed. We did not see that at all. We saw the opposite. If they, if I showed you all the individual ones, you'd see if they weren't depressed, it stayed the same. Nobody got worse. But the many people who had all these high levels of depressive symptoms got dramatically better. Um, we looked at post-traumatic growth, there's actually a scale for that that's well validated. And as you can see, um, people with full and medium dose reported very dramatic post-traumatic growth. You know, that was trying to get the idea that when you can really heal from trauma, you're not just getting back where you started. You know, you're having a very deep healing and growth experience that, that goes beyond just getting rid of the PTSD symptoms. So that was really interesting to see. And um, sleep. People with PTSD have terrible problems with sleep. And we've really seen a lot of improvement. In this scale, ideal sleep is five or less. So nobody got to ideal. But a change from like over 12 to uh, down under 10 or down around 8 is, is a very significant change. And then, Within that, there are quite a few individuals that um, told us, um, you know, they were suddenly sleeping through the night without taking any medicines. I forgot to mention that on those slides with the two lists of medicines, the one on the left, the firefighter, we saw him for his one-year follow-up, and he's doing very well. His caps was very low still, and he's on no medicines. On the, the firefighter, um, is still, uh, after two sessions, uh, after just three sessions, but we measured after two sessions. She's doing very well. She's now taking only melatonin for sleep and sleeping much better. And now Annie's going to read you some, some of the things the participants have said. Thank you, everyone. second session. It feels almost like the inner healer or the MDMA is like a maid doing spring cleaning. It's as if you thought you were cleaning before, but when you, but when you got to things you didn't really want to deal with, you would just stick them in the attic. If you're going to clean the house, you can't skip the stuff in the attic. 
he also said, <clears throat> MDMA is like being the boss of a company and taking a tour of the grounds. Since you don't usually work there, it's confusing, but then you see it's all going well. Everyone's doing their job, so you can go back to being yourself and trust that it's being taken care of, like a program running in the background. A vet who finished his uh, one-year follow-up said this, being in Iraq was bad, but for him what was worse was having his body back here and part of his mind still in Iraq. Being in this study allowed him to bring the rest of him home, and he knows there are a lot of vets who still haven't been able to fully come home. This is a, a quote from somebody in the first study. I don't think I would have survived another year. It's like night and day for me compared to other methods of therapy. Without MDMA, I didn't even know where I needed to go. Maybe one of the things the drug does is let your mind relax and you get out of the way because the mind is so protective about the injury. I keep getting the message from the medicine, trust me, when I try to think, it doesn't work out. But when I just let the waves of fear and anxiety come up, it feels like the medicine is going in and getting them, bringing them up, and then they dissipate. This is the day after. It's like PTSD changed my brain and MDMA changed it back. And seven days after the first session, another veteran. I used to be always jumping into the waves. Now it's more like riding the waves. Another one from the first study. I see huge white doors with beautiful white glass, so huge and heavy, but a master has engineered them so you can open them with one hand. It's only without the fear that the doors are so light. How interesting. If I go up to them with all my fears, it makes me weak. I'm taking those fears out of different parts of my body, looking at them and saying, it's okay, but I'm leaving you here. The fear served me well at one time, but not for now for going through these doors. We just had a milestone a couple of weeks ago where we finished raising the $1.4 million that we needed for the study, the veteran study. So we have funded, fully funded that study, and that's really fantastic. Um, and, and we still have a lot to go. We have a lot more work to do. We have a lot more funds to raise. And so far, only individuals and family foundations have given to this work. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. The work we're doing is, is transformational, like the name of this talk, uh, Transforming Medicine, and it's transforming in a lot of ways. It's not just the MDMA and using these kinds of drugs, but it's the therapy that's just as important and just as transformational as the drug. Annie and Michael sit with people for eight hours, and they are with them for eight hours, and they take phone calls after the therapy from the subjects they work with. Um, this kind of therapy and, and using this drug to open people up and using this kind of therapy is transformational. Um, and it's one of the reasons we can't get support from foundations and government is because what we're doing is, some of it is about, you know, oh, MDMA, it's, you know, risky. But a lot of it is just, 
and as Rick mentioned this too, is it's trans, it's unusual in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know, it's it's about um, doing therapy differently. It's about using a drug differently. It's about living different. It's about different business models, and to take this and ask for money from foundations, traditional foundations, they just don't quite know what box to put in. So we're going to reach out to you again, individuals. Individuals, you know, this, the first study that we've already raised the money for was 1,100 people contributed that many times. Many of them over four years. They gave every year. And the people that gave and the people who are in this room, and I see some of you who, who have given to these studies, um, I want to thank you for doing that, and I want to ask you if you'd like to do it again. And we have people here with these little pledge cards, and they're going to hand you one, and you can write your name on it, and you can help, and you can pledge to end, to end, to complete the study, phase two studies. We would like to next complete fundraising for the study in Boulder that Michael and Ann, Michael mentioned. And we, uh, the budget's 700,000, and we need to raise just about, um, 420,000, and we can do it. And we've done it before and we'll do it, and we will continue to do it because people do share the vision. And I know you in this room do it. So where's Natalie and Allison and Kintia? And there's, a, there's a, like four or five staff people that have these cards, and I'm just gonna ask them to, there's Kintia. <laughs> Kintia works on our IT at MAPS and our database and things like that. And Natalie, it works on public policy, marijuana public policy. Where is Natalie? Hi. Hi. I can't see, all I can see is dark. <laughs> and Allison is our clinical research assistant, and she works on the clinical team, and you'll be, she's gonna be walking around. And when you get this card, you can put your name on here. You can check a box to become a volunteer. You can check a box to make a donation over time. Um, or you can uh, give a donation to Tess, who's still sitting outside probably, and her on the table on the outside. Or if you'd like to give a large amount, and if you'd like to write a check for $420,000 to me, um, <laughs> you can talk to Rick or myself. I would volunteer to be you know, doused with uh, ice water. <laughs> if you would like to do a large check, <laughs> I can join you. Um, we can do our own ice bucket challenge right here on stage. Um, I want to say as we're, as we're passing the cards, this is not just transformational, but it's a game changer. And in, in, here in Silicon Valley, where we are now, um, the idea of disruptive, disruptive technologies that radically change what's happening. This is disruptive technology, and it doesn't really need that much money. The kind of money we're talking here goes on in and out the doors in this valley every day. And this could really change people's lives, as you've seen, it has. So uh, we're going to ask Emmanuel to come up. Where are you? I'm sorry to grab one chair and put it up. Oh, there, here comes a chair. Oh, this is Bryce, by the way. There's a lot of, almost all of MAPS staff is here. And Bryce is our video and multimedia. Brad, is, Brad Birch is our communications director. I think here, he's there's standing up there. there. Brian, there. I'm going to forget somebody's yeah. name if I do this. But always feel free. The whole clinical team is sitting in a row over there. Bera. And they, they're, they're waving their hands. We all have these little um, name tags on, so feel free to talk to us. Um, and I just want to thank you.